Apache Way. The Apache Way is the name that we, the Apache Software Foundation, give to the least worst way we have discovered of developing open source software. And it is not a single monolithic view. It has some divergence, some disagreement, and a lot of history as to why it's ended up as it has. And I'm hoping that our lovely panel here, from greybeards to key new people, will give us a bit of an insight into what it is, how it works, why it's great, and sometimes how it's failed. So could I please ask the panel to give a very brief intro about who you all are, and quickly, if possible, how you got involved in our fun little merry band. <coughs> so, hi, I'm Isabel. Currently on the board of directors with eight other people. Um, it took two minutes after I was elected for a little meme to come up because I was insisting that I'm just one of nine people, not the one person. Um, I came to Apache back when I was at university as part of Nudge. You probably don't remember Nudge unless you're involved. Back then I was working together with the, um, with the project, together with my research group, um, working on something called the Nudge Distributed File System. Today you may better know that as the Hadoop Distributed File System. At some point I created a conference right here after that, someone was crazy enough to um, elect me in to be a member of the foundation. And like I believe two years ago, this gentleman over there suggested that I become a board member. And that's how I got deeper and deeper into it. Uh, my name is Shane Kirkrew, and I currently serve as the vice chairman of the board of directors, along with Isabel and, and another seven directors besides us. Um, I got involved in Apache in 1999 because my day job essentially gave a bunch of code to Apache, and that was our day job to do that. When my day job, of course, changed direction, as companies sometimes often do, I stayed involved at a lower level, because of my free time, and that got noticed. I went to ApacheCon. I made the mistake at ApacheCon one year of following this guy I knew and said, hey, where are you going? He said, oh, we're going to a planning meeting. Can I come? And he said, sure. Now, I was young. And that was my mistake, that I went to a planning meeting voluntarily and I left three hours later being completely overwhelmed and having tasks to do for the next ApacheCon. So that was how I was recognized, voted as a member, um, kept working on organizing how we work internally, sort of the Apache way for how the corporate side works, not just the project sides, and got onto the board and um, it's been a very, very long train since then, but enjoyable. Hello, my name is Lars Aderbrecht. Um I've been involved with Apache, not with the ASF, but with the Apache web server basically since 1995. Um, as far as I remember, I became a, a member of, at that time, the Apache group, um, like in 96, around 96. Um, so basically, I have been with the ASF since the, the, the very, very, very beginning. The reason how I got involved with Apache is, at that time, I was still a student. Um, I was actually asked by a a German uh, publisher to write a book about Apache because they realized, hey, this new open source thing is really, really important. We need more books about that. So they're looking for people to uh, write about the various open source software, whether it's Linux, Apache, and then they approached me. I said, yes. Um, and then I spent a lot of time, um, well, obviously writing the book and finding bugs in Apache, um, submitting lots and lots of bug reports. And at some point, I guess they got annoyed by all the bug reports and said, okay, you have commit access now, please go ahead and fix your own bugs and commit your own patches, it looks okay. So that's how I got involved with, with the patchy and, and the ASF in, in general. Yeah, um, hi, my name is uh, Christopher Dutz. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not quite as uh, involved as long as uh, the, the others before me, but I just had a look at when my first contact with the ASF was, and it was sort of 2001 with the Apache Cocoon project. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll never forget that one day when there was a new Cocoon release, and there was a, a thank you, Christopher Dutz, for reporting this bug. That was totally, totally awesome. And then it took about, I think it was eight years or so, that I was sort of a drive-by committer. Sort of, you, you use stuff and you sort of fire patches at 
hundreds of projects. Um, but it then, uh, when Apache Con in Sinsheim uh, was, uh, I uh, had a few beers at a at a at the hotel bar with Justin. I remember that part, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. Well, that's when I sort of lost control of my free time. <laughs> um, yeah, and well, been uh, sort of when you start committing to one project that doesn't stay that way for quite for very long, sort of got dragged deeper and deeper into it. My name is Merle Kunz. I'm definitely the youngest Apache member on the stage, probably the youngest one in the room. Um, I just got voted in on uh, this, this, this year, actually. Um, I'm also the chair of Apache Finract, and that's how I got into Apache. Uh, Apache Finract started an incubation in December of 2015, and uh, Exactly at the same time, I got hired by a company that was contributing code to that. And uh, in order to, to increase their capacity to contribute code to that. And I very quickly became very interested um, following the incubator list, following the processes, uh, the way it works. And uh, yeah, uh, the rest is history. And uh, here I am. OK, thanks. So one of the things that we say at Apache that can be a bit confusing to new people is if it didn't happen on the list, it didn't happen. Does someone want to say a little bit about why we came up with that rule and what we're trying to protect with our communities by it? Uh, I'll, I'll go. So if it, if it didn't happen on list means if, if the, dis, the decision of we're going to do X or not do X, or the vote, and, and the process by which we reach that decision didn't happen on one of our mailing lists, where you, send a, you subscribe, you send a mail, it goes to everyone, we archive every single mailing list permanently on our own servers. So we have complete control. Everything that's ever been said on a mailing list at Apache, we shall have a copy of. That's valuable because in the future, when we want to argue about something, we can go back, go back and say, here's what the decision was, right? Not just the code that ended up in there, not just the commit log that said, oh, I fixed X. Why did we fix X? Why did we do it this way? All that process is still there. So not only is it valuable for us who are older contributors to remember why we did that, it can train new people who can say, oh, that's why this project goes that direction. That's why this project by Mahout uses this logo because, well, in the earlier session, um, they had a very, 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 very long discussion about the bad logo, and it was sort of nobody would make a new logo, and somebody just checked it in. But now you can see the process, so you can always understand the history of how a project got to where it is because it happened on the list. If it didn't happen on the list, then how do we know it actually happened? Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think one important part is the, the archiving of the list. So if you go to Apache and look, at, uh, look, look, uh, look for the Apache mail archives, you find literally everything um, from the various mailing lists, from the various projects. Obviously, we also have the, some internal mailing lists, foundation mailing lists, where we do the very same. We have a mailing list and we have an archive. Um, I think it's, to some extent, the reason why we choose mail is, is universal. Everyone has an email address. Um, it, it works on every device, it works everywhere. Um, you don't have to discuss, like, do we use Slack, do we use, um, I don't know, uh, WhatsApp, do we use something else? Uh, there's no real discussion about that because it just works everywhere. And it's a bit the history. Initially in, I don't know, 1995 or 1994, when, when Apache was started, it was basically through a mailing list where people got together and started exchanging patches. Um, at that time, you didn't have all these like various instant messaging services that exist today. So mailing lists was kind of like the, the best choice at that time. And in my opinion, it still is the, the best choice because it works across time zones. It's not an instant messaging thing in, in that sense. So you don't have to be there for when a discussion happens. You can go back. You can still contribute even if it's a day later or a few hours later or even a week later, depending on what the discussion is about. I do agree that it's best choice, but it also brings problems with it um, that some of our new contributors often struggle with. So um, we all know information overload today, and it's only getting worse. And um, when you subscribe to an Apache mailing list, you're subscribing to a significant amount of email that you then, you, you then have to work, how, work out how to filter and how to, how to categorize, how to decide what to respond to and what not to respond to. Um, it's a skill that you have to learn when you get into Apache um, to, to handle this volume of mail. And at the same time, it's no longer as modern and cool as it was when I was in college. Um, 
the millenn millennials today uh, don't like email. Uh, and they, when, when you say, here, we're going to do asynchronous communication, um, sometimes it requires some convincing, and sometimes we fail at convincing uh, people to come and join in this asynchronous method of communication. So while it is necessary and important for global working um, to have a form of asynchronous communication, and email is old enough and proven enough to be the superior system for this, it's not without some problems. So there's two points that I would like to add. Um, last, you've been des describing how we use mailing lists and how we archive this. When I explain the, ma the focus on mailing lists, I usually explain that what you want is an archive which you can search, which is stable the URLs. So if you reference a discussion later in time, this URL stays stable through time and which is linkable. So you can share that link with everyone else. And what's also important for Apache is that it's public. So everyone who's using your project can follow along, can see what's happening, referencing back to what Denise said this morning. Open source is about transparency. So you want to make transparent what you're working on, what your plans are, what you want to do next, and where you need help. And this also, for me, ties into the Apache way, where we try to recruit our committers and our developers from the user community. So when I explain Apache to people who are not yet open source people, I tend to tell them that there's a saying like patches welcome and that's typically a help request. So working on a mailing list means making transparent where you need help. It makes transparent where the project is supposed to be going. And from a user perspective, it gives me the transparency into the project and it makes it easy for me to participate. If you have all those design dis discussions and decision-making processes behind closed doors, I cannot participate. I cannot become active. I cannot become one of, your, one of you. So you cannot recruit me in and you cannot share the workload with me. Or with you. Uh, and another thing uh, that sort of felt really strange uh, in the beginning was sort of when we meet at an Apache con, uh, usually uh, several committers of the same project are at the same place, and you, well, you tend to discuss things of your project. Uh, and uh, in order to make it possible to keep the others in the loop, uh, it felt sort of strange in the beginning, so if you were uh, discussing some technical things uh, at, a, at a conference, to sort of write a summary of what you were discussing to keep the others on board. Um, if, for example, I'll just take the, the project I'm currently working on. We have one guy uh, living in Sydney, one guy living in Florida, and one guy, for, for example, me, living in Frankfurt. And it's really hard if you have a synchronous communication uh, stream, uh, it's hard to get them all out of bed at the same time. Okay, so touching on that, um, we often say a minimum of 72 hours for any decision. Um, why is that? One is to cross time zones. Uh, weekends and uh, public holidays. One is that many of these people are working on these projects on an on and off basis. You cannot expect someone to mirror mailing lists on a 24-7 basis. And, and the, the weekends and time zones and the fact that I contribute during the week because I happen to have the time. Many people contribute on the weekend because they don't have the time from their day job. So you need to understand the abilities of all the committers across the project. We've also got, in, at Finneract, we have a couple of committers in um, Cameroon, in the English-speaking part of Cameroon. I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but they don't have power. So they have to drive over to the French-speaking part of Cameroon to get internet access. Um, so we generally give them a little more than 72 hours to make it possible for them to also to contribute. <clears throat> yeah, I guess if you want to make sure that you always stay up to date of what's happening in your project, never go on holiday for more than 72 hours. Is that what we're saying? No. <laughs> okay, so one of the things in Apache we have is the, the plus one, the voting. Um, and sometimes when we get new projects in, they try and vote on everything. Anyone want to talk about voting, voting in moderation and consensus? Uh, it's It's... So the, the, some projects are, are adamantly against voting and use it 
um, as a very specific tool, is when we can't come to consensus and we, we can't sort of talk through, okay, this is good enough and nobody will object to this, even if it's not perfect, then, okay, we're stuck, we'll vote. And they hate it. And they say it's bad, but they use it. And then we have a vote, and then at least the decision is made, so the progress as a whole and the, and the roadmap can continue, whichever way the decision went. Um, we have other projects who like voting for everything. And if that fits their model, um, I think it's fine, as long as the community is you know, well documented and they make it clear that that's how they do things, because at least then you can, you can um, it feels easier to show direct consensus that way. I don't think it's necessary, but some people like to do it. Yeah, I think, uh, Nick, you were talking about voting. However, the, the plus one, minus one thing is not just about voting. Yes, it's, it's obviously used in votes. It's sometimes more about showing consensus or, or showing agreement to something. So in many cases, I've seen people obviously using this. Um, I'm, I'm mainly familiar with the Apache Web Server project. Some projects may do this in a different way. But on the Web Server mailing list, at least, um, if you say something or propose something, people will say plus one or minus one simply because it's the shortest way to just say, yes, I agree with you what, you, what, what you've just said. It's just showing agreement, not necessarily an official vote. So I think there's a, there's a difference there. Some things that wasn't mentioned so far is that it's not only that you can vote with a plus, mo plus one, you can also vote with silence. So you can call a lazy consensus vote, and that means you don't have to reply. By default, you agree with what was communicated. So you don't have to hit reply, enter a, an answer. It's just go ahead. Uh, and maybe uh, while uh, showing consensus by just adding a plus one, that might be an official vote or just a sort of a technical discussion. However, if you disagree, just writing minus one and nothing else, that's typically not treated uh, as a good form. So we usually expect if somebody disagrees, well, he can write minus one, but it's expected to sort of give a little reasoning. Just, just I don't agree is sort of not good style. Yeah, that's, that's very true and very important, especially when someone proposes a patch and you say minus one, I don't like this. At the very least, you should point out the parts that you don't like or the parts where you see a technical problem. Um, that's usually straightforward when it comes to a technical patch. Um, or maybe you even fix the things that you think need fixing or need to be different and say uh, minus one on that, but here's a modified version of that. Um, how, like that's, that's a better option maybe. And then people may, may vote on this or say plus one, minus one. So. We're not super formal with our voting, though. Um, and sometimes we do the rules pretty ad hoc. Like, for example, in Finract, we wanted to accept new code into it that I had been working on. So much of it had been done off list, which it shouldn't have been done. Um, I asked for uh, a two-thirds vote, which there's no rule anywhere that says it has to be a two-thirds vote. But I asked for a two-thirds vote because I wanted to make sure a lot of people were on board. Um, I wanted to uh, get that extra level of approval. Um, and so voting isn't always just like 50% you win, 49% uh, you lose. Sometimes it's also a, a, a way of, of involving people in the decision-making process a little more. Okay. So one question we often get from new companies getting involved in Apache for the first time is, who do I pay for a seat on the board and who do I pay to make this happen? And yes, as you see, we, we all giggle. Um, <laughs> why, why do we say no to their money in that way? What are, what are we trying to prevent? What are we trying to do instead? Um, because we're independent of commercial influence. I mean, that's because, <laughs> so a fundamental part of the Apache brand, both as what we as members all feel internally, as well as part of the value to contributors who are coming to us, is that our board is made up of independent members of the foundation who have been elected internally. So it's not like it's just a self-selecting board who sort of slowly moves. It's, it's people who have shown merit across the 600 members who are all very senior people in the technical world. So there's, it's, I don't want to say it's competitive, but it's people who really, really want to be here and people who are really well respected by this broad base of peers who believe in this mission and we want to make software for the public good, which is different from what a board wa a company wants when they want to buy a seat. 
Yeah. And uh, it has happened several times that sort of, well, let's say the interest of a, co a certain company sort of was uh, contradicting the, uh, well, the needs of the community and sort of try to influence that. And uh, the Apache Software Foundation has proven to uh, show, uh, what, what do you say in English, uh, show your teeth and sort of, well, uh, get rid of that influencing problem. I would like to turn that around a little bit. You don't pay the foundation, you pay your employees. And they then pay to the foundation with time. Someone also translated it to paying with time and love. You stay around, you stick around, and that's how you gain influence. So it doesn't mean that people here do that on their volunteer time unpaid. They typically are paid by their employers. And trust me, it's a good way to keep employees happy within your workforce. One, one thing I've actually seen quite a bit in the, in, the, in the history of the ASF is that once, I mean, because membership is for individuals only. You cannot become a member as a, as a company. There's no pay-to-play kind of thing, um, which is what Denise mentioned this, this morning. Um, but I've seen many cases where someone was initially paid to contribute to a project, but even after leaving that company for whatever reason, continued to contribute or continued to contribute to the foundation in general or to other projects. So that's a fairly common thing. How many of these people do we have in the audience? One, four, two, I know at least one over here. <laughs> Avoiding my stare. <laughs> Jim, can you take a for the... <laughs> no, just a little history note. I mean, the start of the ASF was all about self-directed altruism. The reason why we did what we're doing is because we needed a web server, and the person who was running the web server and creating the web server went away. It wasn't because this wasn't a school project. It wasn't something we were doing because we just wanted to. We had jobs and responsibilities based on that. So from the very, very beginning, there's always been this quite very tight line between doing things for passion but also doing things because they need to get done and because your job depends on it. Denise introduced the term this morning of a duocracy. So you can pay your employees to do and if they're doing, then they can influence. And that's, that's the only way you have in, really. And I'll, I'll just add one, one quick note. So the Apache Software Foundation is a US 501c3 public charity. It's a corporation. We file an annual tax return. We don't, we don't pay taxes. We still have to file in the US. Um, we, we have officers and directors. We have a formal annual meeting of shareholders. So that's part of what we're talking about as directors or as members running the foundation paying our, our contractors. The other part of Apache, which is probably what most people are familiar with, is the projects, right? Every single project has this model of voting and merit and so on. So a lot of the, uh, there's, a, there's a very obvious way to show from your company's duocracy, paying your employees because then you get the better web server that your company wants to do something else with. It's a little bit different model when you're, when you're paying an Apache member to work on the corporate things. So that's sort of an interesting, topic of, of long-term sustainability of how we do that and how we make sure we have enough members who can act independently and have time to do all the legal bits and the paperwork that have nothing to do with code. Okay. Um, looking at a uh, lawyer in the front row, I think I should ask a question about our license and how it's different. So without inviting or igniting a giant flame war, <laughs> can we get a potted history on um, why we've chosen to go down the the route we have with our license and why we're not so keen on letting incubating projects combine incompatible ones. Um, just the, maybe a little bit on the history of the license itself. Initially, when the web server was created, it was based on the NCSA web server, which came with the BSD-style license. Um, it was open source, so uh, the Apache guys at that time, Jim was involved at that time, basically took... Um, that NCSA code and included their own patches and it eventually called it Apache. Um, and they simply kept the license. Um, it became the Apache license, but it was still a BSD style license. And only with the, as Denise explained in her talk this morning, with the, with the creation of the ASF, with the foundation, 
um, it became uh, the, the second version of the license, which included the intellectual property related details and, and all that. Um, and one thing a lot of people uh, I've been talking to recently sort of were a little confused about because uh, if you, for example, take the G GPL license, which sort of, well, you can use this piece of software for free, uh, but you have to make the product you built with this uh, software free too. Um, because they thought that, uh, well, if you just give it away for free and don't have any of this uh, copyleft restriction on it, uh, everything good that happens with this piece of software will be sort of some corporate uh, property and not given back. But looking back the f last few years, what's happening in the big data sector and stuff like that, it's all Apache licensed and it's growing and growing and growing. Uh, so, uh, hmm? The Sorry, just one more comment in terms of GPL. I, I believe that obviously there are many use cases where the GPL makes sense. However, I strongly believe that if um, the Apache group at that time would have chosen the GPL for the web server, I'm not sure we would have the ASF today. That's at least my opinion. Yeah, I think, um, so you were talking a little bit about it, the motivation behind the license, and part of it is rooted in the altruism, in that we want to be a universal donor for anyone. So anyone who wants to take our software and use it, great. Anyone who wants to take our software and modify it and use it, great. Anyone who wants to take our software, modify it, and then give that away to anyone else, that's great. We want to be able to make sure that there's maximum freedom for users of our software at any level of distribution in the future. Now, of course, somebody along the way can take a derivative project and then make a proprietary version out of it. Okay, that's fine. I mean, it'd be nice if you did it publicly, but that's fine. We've still given stuff away to all the other people along the way. So we believe in maximum freedom for users is most important for our model. So I cannot answer the question on behalf of the ASF. I can only answer it on behalf of myself. When I started a project at the ASF, I remember going through documentation from the Free Software Foundation and from the Free Software Foundation Europe, and they've got a matrix of which license should you apply given what you want to achieve in the market? And a Apache license is great, great if you want to break into existing markets, if you want to push towards a standard with your technology. And I think then Apache is a great way. And just one tidbit, um, the Apache license is one of the very few open source licenses that explicitly adds a disclaimer for trademarks, which is not technically necessary, but I think is a very friendly thing to do because open source licenses are, of course, copyright licenses, and none of them grant you trademark, trademark rights. Uh, if you're a company that's got some code that they want to open source and bring to the foundation, what do they need to do? Come to our talk tomorrow. Um, Justin and I will be talking about uh, bringing the, uh, a project in, Justin's right over there, by the way. Um, we'll be talking about bringing projects into the Apache Software Foundation via incubation. Uh, what you do is uh, first you find a champion, write a proposal, uh, and then you go through the process of practicing being a community, scrubbing your IP, making releases, that are appropriately licensed. Uh, and then, if you do that long enough, successfully enough, then you can become a top-level project. That's the, the short version of it. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of details, and we're gonna go into some of the details tomorrow. So for some of the details, I would start that story a little bit earlier. You wanna think about why you wanna come to Apache. Do you only want the trademark? Or do you wanna adopt our way of working? And do, do you have the same goals that we have? One thing that I found many projects struggle with. Many of these projects come from single um, developers or single companies. Having been developed at a single company means that these people had ultimate control over these projects. A lot of these projects and a lot of these people struggle with giving up control. As I mentioned earlier, I started Apache Mahout within the Apache Software Foundation. At some point, someone came up hey, I'm gonna write a book about the project. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is something that I wanted to do. I'm really jealous now. Except five minutes later I realized I don't have time to do it, but I do want this book to exist. So I was really happy that someone took up the work and did that for me. 
However, this kind of thought process and this kind of letting, letting off control does take a little bit of education. And it does take a little bit of trust both in your community and in yourself. So what helps for that is to understand why you went to Apache and why you're going through all that. Uh, and maybe uh, one of uh, just recently I sort of uh, saw uh, one of the big benefits of uh, the, the Apache incubator uh, process because um, I joined a project, an incubating project. I, I heard about that in ApacheCon in Miami. I was totally, oh wow, this is a cool project. I want to be part of this. Started contributing. Was invited uh, as one of the first uh, committers in that project outside of that one company the code was donated by. Um, and then a few months later, uh, that company decided to, well, let's say, shift their priorities. And they sort of pulled their people uh, off the project so they no longer had the time to work on it. So now we have a project and that's sort of hanging in the air a little. Uh, and that's sort of one of the reasons why we sort of ensure that a project that uh, is uh, announced top level has a very diverse uh, committer base that stuff like that doesn't happen. I think one important thing with the ISF is that uh, we want to make sure that if there is a top level project, um, that there is a healthy community around it. That if as a, as a user, as a, as a customer, as a, as a company picking that framework, software, whatever it is, you can be sure that it will be supported and there is some kind of support for, for, for the software. Um, the incubator didn't exist since the very beginning of the ASF. I forgot how long it took when it was created. I know, looking at Jim, was it a couple of years after the ASF was created? One, maybe, yeah, so like, like two, two years later, basically, because we saw uh, the need, we, we wanted more projects, or there, there was a need for um, more, more projects. People were looking at different things, wanted to do more stuff at the ASF, and we were like, okay, how, how do we set up these projects? How do we make sure that all the new committers, uh, you cannot expect them from day one to understand how the Apache way works. Sometimes when it is um, a contribution from a company, you have to make sure that things like trademark details have been sorted out, etc., before you actually make it a proper um, ASF project. That was um, the, the main reason why the incubator was created, and why we have that period um, a project has to go through uh, before it can become um, a proper top-level project um, at, at the ASF. And, and really briefly to go back to Isabel's point, um, if you're thinking about coming to the incubator, the most important thing overall is what, why you're doing it, but realize that if you bring a project to the incubator and it succeeds and it becomes a top-level project, it is no longer your project. It is Apache's project in terms of a legal and trademark sense and it is that community's project in terms of an actual who does the work. And that community will be an independent community, um, which is a good thing. But as Isabel said, uh, not everybody uh, understands why that's a good thing until they've worked on it. And there are cases where maybe you don't want to do that. And there are maybe projects that don't want to be in the incubator. And that is fine. You just need to understand it before. And you may need to make an informed decision. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, so does anyone in the audience want to ask a question? And can we steal one of the microphones? Thank you. Um, thanks so much for talking a bit about this, it was very interesting. Uh, I'm the president of KDE EV, um, and KDE in many ways is very similar to Apache, but in at least one important way, very different. Um, you were talking about voting and, and decision making. And for KDE, the mantra is, who does the work decides? Um, and could you talk a bit about how that's different for, for Apache more? I, I guess one, one, one thing I think in terms of thinking about how Apache works is the terminology. So whoever does the work decides is whoever. So some person who has written the code just gets to check it in. That's different from the Apache model, where the, the best way to do it is to think of the community around this project is going to decide on something. So part of the incubation process is making sure we have diversity, right? So if any company goes away, if, you know, if you're sick for a month 
and you know, you're on vacation, that there's somebody else to continue the project. So the first thing about Apache's difference is that we explicitly have a community mindset, and thus the community has to be involved in the decisions. That's, the, I think, the first difference. Um, yeah, well, and uh, let's say, uh, in order to get a vote at Apache, you have to do some work. It doesn't have to be coding. It can be sort of supporting, speaking at conferences, and whatever. But you have to do work in order to usually get the right to vote. So I'd say it's not that different, but just it's sort of uh, the, the merit you earn doesn't sort of expire. So if you worked once really hard, then maybe a year or not, you don't lose your vote. I think it's also important that uh, everybody in the community who is affected by a decision uh, get the opportunity to participate in that decision. So in the case that I mentioned earlier, where we were bringing in code from the outside, yeah, if I, as a duocracy, I could just say, here, code, plump. Um, but everybody else, I was going to ask everybody else to help me maintain that. And so that wouldn't have been fair without explicitly asking them, will you help me maintain this code? I think um, I want to make one thing clear. It sounds a little bit like we do a lot of voting at the ASF. <laughs> um, mailing list filled with plus ones and maybe some minus ones. That's not really the case. Um, one uh, terminology that, that's been used at the ASF is uh, review then commit and um, commit then review, which is basically depending which in which stage your, your development is or if you have a stable and a development branch or something. Typically the development branch is um, commit then review. So basically whoever implements something, whoever gets the job done uh, can just commit that. However, if someone disagrees with that, um, disagrees typically means there's a technical reason why there's something wrong with it, um, then yeah, either, either uh, patch, uh, provide a patch and fix the issue, or in some cases it may mean that um, a, a commit has to be taken out again. Um, if, it, if it is co controversial and needs actually, for example, in the extreme case, an official vote where the community or the, the PMC, the, the project management committee, actually does an official vote and say, do we want this new feature or this new different direction this, this code is going. Um, outside of the development uh, projects, it's the same. It's not like we vote on every little little bit, otherwise you wouldn't get anything done. Um, it is, a, to a large part, a, a duocracy. Like, if you have time to, to get something done, that's great. And unless it's a controversial thing, everyone's usually happy that something got done. Did we have any other questions? We have time for one last question and one little answer. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> I'll, I'll point out that these faces and the faces of the hecklers will be around all of today and tomorrow. <laughs> so if we don't get your question, just, just come find us. We will. If you're in Berlin, I'm living here. So you can catch me later after the conference as well. <laughs> I'll ask you later. It's OK. Get com some coffee. You can, you can always visit us in the Apache Lounge. You know we have free ice cream there. So just in case you haven't noticed that yet. Sorry, was there another question? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, well, I've not worked with the Apache Foundation, but in my experience um, working not with other foundations, I've seen that a lot of problems come from the way employers think. Um, so, like, with the incubator concept, uh, some employers will say, well, if you are an incubated project, not an official project of some foundation, we will not let you work there because it's not strategic enough for, for us or it's not, it's not have enough visibility. And another thing that I've seen is that there is kind of the expectation or misconception that contributing to a community just means uh, proposing and pushing some code into a code base, while obviously it's something very different. I mean, you need to review other people's code, get, build trust relationship with everyone. And so, so my question is, what does the uh, Apache Foundation, uh, Apache Software Foundation do to work with companies to kind of change the mentality into for employers to help people, software engineers to actually work in a healthy way? You're trying very hard to do this. <laughs> Uh, so what does the Apache Software Foundation do for this? We have some very clear branding guidelines around our projects. Um, we projects report to the board quarterly so we can see if a, if a specific project is unfairly treating new contributors from different places. But the foundation doesn't, we don't go out to companies and say, hey, you want to work with us. 
uh, if there's a company who wants to come, great. Um, more importantly, it's, it's project communities. If there's an interesting piece of technology that has a project community that you know, wants to find new committers, they'll go out and you know, be useful. So it's, we, we don't go looking for people. People come to us. Um, and it's basically, quickly. if a, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if you can be quick, because we want to yeah, no, just saying, if, if a company doesn't want to pay the, the, the salary of a person to full-time contribute to a project or even part-time, it's unfortunately their choice. If they haven't grasped the idea of open source, if it's not really their, within their strategy, then that's unfortunately um, their, their right to do. Um, as, an, as an employee there, maybe it's time to pick a different company who allows you to, to contribute to open source. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but... Okay, unfortunately we're out of time, so can we have a big thank you to all of our panel? Thank you, thank you to Nick for telling me about that I was going to be on the panel at, you know, a whole day ahead of time this time. Thanks, Nick. So, if you want to know more, we've got our website. Come find us. Come talk to us. Have an ice cream. And, um, yeah, have an ice cream. Thank you. Thank you.